now an inspired word this morning, John 10, 1 through 10. I'll read it from the version up on the screen here. It's a little bit more uh, easier translation to follow. John 10, 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech or this parable Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. It's the reading of God's word to us. May he bless it to each and every one of us. Well, we're picking up from where we left off uh, a month or so ago when we were back in John. We've had a season in Psalms and it's a blessing to pick up here in John 10 verses 1 through 10. Having said that, We can't disconnect chapter 9 from chapter 10 because it is very much the same story, although there's been a chapter delineation put in there. So as we start uh, a new chapter, we've got to remember the story continues. It's like watching your episodes at home. If you're watching an episode series, you've got to remember it's picking up from where it most likely left off, and this is the same thing here. So who's Jesus talking to? He's addressing... The Jewish leaders, the Pharisaical leaders of the day, who thought they saw but didn't see. They said they had no sin and because of that they were blind. And Jesus is saying to them, you guys don't get it. You think you're the real deal? You're not saved. You're not uh, one of the lords. And um, they're getting very, very uh, anxious about the Lord Jesus' teaching. Not only that, we're about to see why Jesus goes into the teaching on the false true shepherds, because what have they just done with this blind man who Jesus has healed? As so-called shepherds in God's church, these pharisaical leaders, this blind man, and go back and have a look at it in chapter 9, this blind man has been kicked out of the temple. Uh, he's been excommunicated, so to speak, by these loving shepherds. And Jesus has found him on the side of the temple and said, I am your Lord, I am your master, I am the one uh, whom you're to believe in. And he says, Lord, I believe. All right. So what we've got is a a true shepherd, Jesus, finding this sheep that's been excommunicated out of the so-called synagogue. And then you've got all of these false people following these false shepherds. And Jesus is now about to go into what a true godly leader looks like in his house. So there's going to be a real picture here that the Lord brings about and he's teaching another parable. A parable is there to illustrate a natural story or a picture, a word picture of a spiritual truth. So he's communicating spiritual truths. Now, how is this helping you this morning? Well, I'm not a shepherd, I'm not a pastor. How's this passage going to help me? Well, how's it going to help you is a very good question because although you might not ever be called to be an under-shepherd in God's house or to shepherd God's sheep, as a sheep in God's house, as one who is called uh, by the Lord to be a, a, she- a sheep in his sheepfold or a, uh, a, 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 um, a sheep in his pasture or one of his called ones that hear his voice and follow him, we're called to not only follow the great sh- chief shepherd but We are given under shepherds that we are to follow. Paul says it himself, follow me as I follow the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord appoints, Ephesians 4, pastors in his church, under shepherds, elders. And your job as a sheep is to listen to the uh, the, the shepherd's 
the true shepherd's voice, the one who's truly preaching Christ, the one who truly represents Christ, and to not listen and to flee from those who are false shepherds. And it doesn't take much of a look around our modern day world to see that there's a lot of people out there saying, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm a shepherd, but they're not preaching Christ and they're not acting like a true shepherd should. And so as a sheep here this morning, this teaching is invaluable because at some point in time, the enemy is very interested in getting you out of the true sheep fold and into something that it is away from that so that he can basically steal you away from the true um, uh, church, kill your faith, and destroy you in hell. Right? That's, that's the plan of the devil. All right? He's got that plan for every believer. But of course we've got the great promise that none can take us out of the Lord's hand. So the Lord doesn't lose any of his own. He's the good shepherd, as we'll go on and find out. But there's some real principles that uh, as a shepherd for myself and of course as um, sheep we're to be very wary of uh, as we go into this uh, these guys as false shepherds uh, they don't see that Jesus is the true shepherd of the sheep in front of them they don't see uh, Christ in a saving or spiritual sense here whatsoever uh, he's teaching and they're not even getting it it's a proof that they're not saved um, we're going to see Jesus as the true shepherd of the sheep everyone He's the archetype, and we're going to see that he is the door. The door is the access point. Nobody gets into the church unless they're saved through Christ, not through Mary, not through the saints, not through some religious order. They are saved through Christ. He is the door. Friends, not a door, not a way. He is the way. And so we've got to remember here that Jesus is teaching an exclusive salvation only through him into entry into the true church. Amen, everyone? All right, got one amen there. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm sure we'll get maybe one or two more as we go. So let's now have a little bit of a look uh, at where we're going with this. Um, and Jesus is strong. In essence, what Jesus is doing here is he's condemning every preacher, even in our modern day context, that is not preaching him, that is not preaching the true shepherd. Right? And that's an indicator of that. As we lead into the psalm, J.C. Ryle says... Uh, of this particular passage, that the true shepherd of souls is he who enters the ministry with a single eye to Christ, desiring to glorify Christ, doing all in the strength of Christ, preaching Christ's doctrine, walking in Christ's steps, and labouring to bring men and women to Christ. The false shepherd, however, of souls is he who enters the ministerial office with little or no thought about Christ. They have worldly and self-exalting motives and they come from a desire uh, not to exalt Jesus uh, and point him out as the great salvation that is found in him. Christ, in one word, uh, Ryle says, is the grand touchstone of the minister of religion. The man who makes much of Christ is the pastor after God's own heart, whom God delights to honour. The minister who makes little of Christ is one whom God regards as an imposter, as one who has climbed up to his holy office, not by the door, but by some other way. You see the difference, everyone? That's where the Lord Jesus is going here in this passage. We'll see uh, three stages in this passage, ten verses. The first two verses, verse one, are the marks of both a false and then a true shepherd. Jesus will give us the disparity between the two. Then... Uh, verses 3 through 7, Christ will be pointed as the true shepherd of the sheep and what true shepherds, the process they go through. Uh, and secondly, or thirdly, should I say, uh, we'll see in verses 8 through 10, Satan is the great thief and robber of, um, uh, a tempter of the thief and robber of uh, the church. And so Jesus, uh, to be clear here, is using a shepherding analogy I'm going to start uh, in our verse here. But, but let's be clear that this shepherding analogy that Jesus is using would have been very easy for everyone in his day to hear. The Jewish leaders would have known what a shepherd looks like, the role, the function, the task. It would have been easy to know exactly what Jesus was referring to. Now, the life of a shepherd uh, was a tough job. Uh, the shepherd was not an easy career out. All right, you were always on call. 
you couldn't clock off. Uh, th there were just always issues. It was an A, a hard job, an arduous job. Um, it was outside. You were in the elements all day long. Hot, cold, wind, rain. And sheep. Let's talk about sheep for a minute. Well, they wander. Uh, if you're on a cliff or a high plateau area, they can fall off the edge. They're not always looking. I mean, sheep aren't strategic animals. They're not looking forward to the future. They're not that eagle that's floating on the current winds looking for the prey miles off. They're kind of head down, I'm eating, and they're not even looking to their shepherd most of the time. What are they doing? They're listening to their master's voice and their or their shepherd's voice. Uh, there is generally no protection for them. Uh, it was easy for a sheep to get lost, to stray, and become prey to who? Wolves, predators. Uh, predators weren't the only, uh, like wolves, weren't the only uh, things that sheep needed to worry about. They needed to worry about thieves. Thieves, back in the day, uh, of the shepherding analogy, uh, would come up to the sheepfold uh, and they would sneak over the fence at night. They would grab a sheep, get the knife, slit its throat, throw it back over the wall, and then eat it, basically skim it, uh, and, and take its wool, make money from it, and then eat it, basically devour its flesh. All right? So it became lamb year off, uh, and we'll sell off the wool and make some money. All right? And I know I'm playing on words here, but it's pretty... That was the end result. All right? And this is... Although very graphic, everyone, this is what Jesus is warning us about. There are lots of false shepherds out there. How do we know they're a false shepherd? They're in it for themselves, what they can get from you, what they can get out of you. They want something from your wool, and they want something out of you. They want some blood. They want what they can get from you. All right? And this is not an ideal setting to find yourself in as a true sheep. Uh, so we're going to get into this context. Let's remember... The Bible isn't uh, ignorant on shepherds up until this point. Can anyone think of who was a shepherd in the Bible? Think Old Testament. Who was a shepherd? David's a shepherd. David even says himself, uh, he was the one who wrote Psalm 23 that we've just read. Uh, and of course, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And of course, uh, Psalm 23 is just a beautiful psalm of showing us how David related to the Lord himself. But remember, David was a man after God's own heart. Technically, he was a shepherd after God's own heart. What do we know about David? He's pretty gutsy. How did he protect God's flock? You remember, he talks about this in the scripture, doesn't he? There was a, a bear that came after and was after, a, after one of the sheep and he protected the sheep and took on the bear, he took on the lion, didn't he? Alright, so he put his life, he was ready to risk his life for the safety of his own sheep. Alright, he was taking care of his father's sheep, shepherding them and making sure uh, that they were taken care of. Who else was a shepherd? Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac, Jacob, they're all shepherds. I mean, we talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all shepherds. What about Moses? He was a shepherd. He looked after his father-in-law's uh, herd in the land of Midian. So Moses is a shepherd. And of course, God is seen uh, in Psalm 23 as the great shepherd. Jesus, in Hebrews 10, is the great chief shepherd of every single soul. Of course, Jesus becomes uh, not only the great door to the church or the sheepfold, but he's the great good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. Notice, everyone, Jesus doesn't lay his life down for anyone else, the goats, the wolves. Jesus lays down his life for his sheep, and he knows his sheep by name. So there's deep theology here, everyone, as we go into this. Jesus already knows who he's dying for, for the joy set before him. He laid down his life. He knows his sheep. He calls them by name. God chose you. You did not chose him. So we've got divine predestination, election. We've got uh, effectual calling. We've got a lot of great solid doctrines here that we're going to be hammering out when we look at how the Lord takes care of his sheep. All right? Now, let's get into our text. And as we do, I want you to turn in advance to Ezekiel 34 as we see how uh, the Lord speaks through Ezekiel towards the false shepherds and what the Lord will do to gather his true sheep into his 
sheepfold. So Jesus is directly, as you're turning there to Ezekiel 34, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 in a moment. Jesus is addressing the so-called leaders in the church. He begins with truly, truly, another truth that's not to be missed. And Christ is starting out on the negative first, exposing the false shepherds. It's obvious to spot a false shepherd because in verse 1, Jesus says they're going to do what? You're going to spot them because they're what? They will not go through the door. They will not go through Christ. They will climb over. They'll find another way. All right. So they're opportunists. Uh, they are people that will not submit to the sanctifying work of Christ. They won't submit to the qualifications of an elder. They will, they will take opportunity to become men of religion, to get a place of authority, to then lord it over God's sheep. They're not divinely called. Uh, they're not um, led by Christ. Uh, and as one author says, unconverted ministers of the dry rot of the church. Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 12. Let's have a look at this. Uh, I think we do have it up here on the screen if you don't have a Bible in front of you. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed the sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 10, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I suggest to you that's not a good place to find yourself. And I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves and I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. What a picture that is. The shepherds have the sheep in their own mouths, devouring them that they may not be food for them. But thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. And as a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from the places when they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is going to go on to mention the one great shepherd who is representative of Christ, and Christ fulfills this passage. And during the great ingathering in the millennial period, God will gather all of his sheep to himself. Well, there's no doubt that the scriptures are clear of who a false shepherd is and who a true shepherd should look like and that God is against false shepherds in both Old and New Testament contexts. These shepherds enter in by some other way. They're not God appointed. They're not Christ appointed. They don't go through the door. They're man appointed, self appointed. They're certainly not God appointed. They love religion. They love their religious life. Uh, as one of my friends would say, you know how they swing around the smoke sensor and they do all the chants and you know have all the visuals. They love the bells and the smells, all right. But they don't love the Lord Jesus. Unlike David, they are not men after God's own heart. At the core and thrust of everything they're about, they are self-seeking. There's something in it for them, and you'll find yourself as a sheep going. They just want more. They take more. Uh, that's all they're about. Uh, they are the blind leading the blind, and you end up both in the ditch. They're thieves, they're robbers. What's a thief and a robber there to do? A thief enters your house when you're not there secretly to get as much out of that house in a quicker time as he possibly can. He doesn't want to be caught. He or she is going to get in and get out and get on with the job real quick, and they want to get on with the rest of their life. There's no love. They're in it for what they can get out of it. So we're very clear here on the picture that Jesus is painting. They're there to get, they're there to take. And a true shepherd 
is, is the antithesis of that. They're there to feed and to nurture and to lay their life down and to give everything they can to you. Ask yourself the question, what, are, what is the shepherd that you're following? The under shepherd, are they asking, give, 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 or are they giving back to you? Sure, there's a balance of serving in the life of the church. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just draining the sheep and getting everything you can from them and leaving them destitute of all that they have. I mean, this is stereotypical of a cult leader, you know, somebody that's seriously in it for their own aggrandizement and profiteering. If you are to know a true minister, you're to ask the age-old question, what do they make of Christ? Do they preach him? Do they obey him? Do they worship him? The congregant must ask as they hear his sermons. Where is Christ in the sermon? Where is the lamb? Where is the door? Where is the saviour? You need to ask yourself that, even in my sermons. Is he preaching Christ? Is he pointing us to the Lord? Is he in love with the Lord Jesus? Or is this all about where he's going or what he wants to do? Verse 2, but he that enters in by the door. Here's the positive. He that enters in through Christ is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus speaks now of true ministers. Let's get a picture of what's going on here because without the pastoral picture of the sheepfold, we don't know what's going on. So let me explain how this works. The sheep are in the sheepfold. The shepherd has come back from a hard day or a, a few days or a week out in the field. I want you to get this because this leads into all of the, the next passage that we're going to be spending time in. So the shepherd is out with the sheep. Why is he taking them out? Because he needs to take them. The pasture is where they can eat. So you've got to take your sheep place to place because they've got nothing to eat if you keep them in one place. It's going to be dry real quick. So the shepherd's job is to take them into safety and then out to eat. That's why we get the words or the terms in and out. So the shepherd comes back from a day. Now he's exhausted. He spent all of his day making sure the sheep are together, tapping them with his rod and his staff. Hey, get back in. Come on. Hurry up. All right? And so he's shepherding them, he's looking out, he's taking them to a place where he knows there's good green pasture, they can eat, they can lie, they can rest, and he can uh, look out for them and he brings them back. And at the end of the day, he's exhausted. So he goes to the sheepfold. Now this is a community sheepfold. So there's going to be like 8 or 10 or 15 people's sheep all in this big sheepfold. And he's going to drop them off there. And he's going to go to a local inn or somewhere where he can rest and have a meal and just rest for the night until he picks them back up in the morning. So what happens is the sheep are all in this huge sheepfold. And there could be, I don't know, let's say you've got 20 people in your herd, uh, 20 sheep in your herd, but then you've got another 30, another 20, another 50. And so uh, what happens is in the morning, the shepherd comes back to the doorkeeper. The porter, the doorkeeper, the hired hand, and he is paid to be there. He's not the shepherd. What is he? He's just looking after the sheep for the night. I'm the same full-time gig for me. It's just me looking after. I get paid to do a job. I just make sure overnight that I don't lose what's yours or I'm going to get in trouble. All right? I'm doing it for what I can get out of it. He's the hired hand that we'll see later on. He's the hireling. All right? So the shepherd comes back to the sheep, and the doorkeeper knows that that's the shepherd because that's the shepherd that dropped his sheep off last night. And so the doorkeeper knows the shepherd and lets the shepherd into the sheepfold. And watch this, everyone. Then the shepherd calls out his sheep by, by name. And the sheep, although they're not necessarily the smartest creature in the world, guess what sheep have? they got good ears. <laughs> and they can hear the tone of the shepherd. And... Uh, like all of us have. Who has a pet in the room? Give me a wave if you've got a pet. Your pet has a name, right? All right? Celeste, what do you have? A dog or a cat? We have a bunny. You have a bunny. What's your bunny's name? Chester. It's Chester. So the shepherd would walk into the sheepfold and say... Well, maybe not Chester. <laughs> but whatever the name the sheep was, and, and, and the shepherd had a name for every sheep. He knew, he knew the sheep by name. This is where it all comes from. So this analogy is foreign to us, but to the shepherds of the day, 
So he knew everything about them. He knew that they, they're a little hairier. They've got problems with this. They, they struggle with They wander off a lot more than that other sheep. So the shepherd knows them intimately. And so he calls them by name. And miraculously, as he's standing there calling them, out of the crowd, the sheep come to him because they know his voice. They know that they're safe with him. And then he takes them out of the sheepfold, leaves them in the pasture, and then brings them back again. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what the Lord Jesus does with us. And this is actually now Jesus not speaking of himself. He's speaking of what a true shepherd does in the church. Because what is he doing right now? He's exposing the false shepherds. All right? So a shepherd should know his sheep by name. Uh, by the way, everyone, this really undermines the mega church of our modern day and age where a pastor does not even know their people by name. What was your name again? I mean, if you got, yes, the church was big. In, in the New Testament, 3,000 people saved on the first day, but there were pastors and deacons, people that did know what the issues were and did know the people by name. So I'm not saying the church can't be big. Please hear me here. But what I am saying is this whole idea of a mega pastor with a mega church and nobody knows who anyone is, people roll up and walk out the door, that is not shepherding according to the Lord Jesus. All right? And so I have no problems in my mind thinking if I'm a pastor and I'm looking out for God's sheep, I don't necessarily want to have 5,000 people because that's a lot more I'm accountable for on that day. So we need to be careful of what's going on here and looking at the dynamics of what the Lord expects of his people. So he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So we know that he who enters in by the door, he who is a true shepherd enters in through Christ's calling, through the door. Christ is the door of the sheep. So there will be evidence in a true shepherd that Christ has called them. They love the Lord Jesus and there's true evidence that they are called by Christ. Isn't this true of everyone called in the Bible? Were not the disciples called by Christ? Amen, everyone? Was not Saul called by Christ? You are Saul, you will be Paul. You are called to preach my name and to suffer much for my glory. And note this, everyone, a true shepherd will not only be A, if you're writing these down, called by Christ, B, they will have a heart for the sheep. They are the shepherd of the sheep. They're not in it for what they can get out of it. They are the shepherd of the sheep. They're in it uh, to feed the sheep, to lead God's people. They're not in it for the crowds or the glory or the position or the title. And finally, they're a part of the sheepfold. They're a part of the true church. So a true man of God is called by Christ. They're in it for the sheep and they're a part of the church. None of this, I'm a, I'm a shepherd, but I do my own thing and I make stuff out of it. You've got to be called by Christ, love God's people, and be a part of the church. Amen, everyone? Amen. It's very clear according to the Lord's teaching. Verse 3, to him, the porter opens up, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice and he calls them out and he leads them out. All right, so a sheep have a very clear look at verses 3 and 4. The shepherd's job, you can highlight it, is to lead. You can see it there in verse 3. He calls them by name and he leads them out. Every pastor has a job to lead the sheep. What's the sheep's job in verse 4, everyone? Can you see it? What's their job? Their job is to follow. You've got two jobs. You're to follow. And in verse 5, if it's somebody dangerous, you order what's the F word? Flee. You see it? Don't miss it. You've only got a couple of real good jobs to do. Make sure you're following a true shepherd. Eat of the good pastor, of the teaching of the word that they bring. And if somebody's not a true shepherd, if they're a false teacher, what's your job? Get out of there. Flee. You do not follow them. The gatekeeper opens the door to the true shepherd. The true shepherd is a part of the true church. The sheep hear his voice. Why do they hear his voice? Because the true shepherd is preaching Christ. And they know it. What did Paul tell Timothy? Preach the word. Don't preach your testimony. Don't preach a motivational message. Preach the word. Shepherding is not just caring alone. Caring is preaching and feeding God's people. What did Jesus tell Peter? Feed my sheep. That wasn't put them on a 12-step counselling plan. That was preached to them God's word. That is care. 
You want pastoral care? Ask. Is my pastor teaching me God's word? Is he pointing me to Christ? Is he caring for me like Christ would care for me if Christ was my pastor? And hopefully the answer is yes. A true shepherd should lead the flock into green pastures. You should be fed. You should be nourished. Yes, you should self-feed at home during the week. You should be doing devotions and reading God's word and praying to the Lord. Amen, everyone. But on a Sunday, you should come and you should be able to know that as a sheep in God's sheepfold, you can just eat of the pastures. You can put your head down and you don't have to worry about a wolf that's coming over the fence or a robber that's coming in through the side to grab you and slit your throat. You know you're safe. You're in a safe church. You can hear an empowering, and encouraging, a feeding message that will feed your soul. And then you can go back out into the world Get on with the job you're meant to do. Be a witness. Be a light. You can go in and out safely in the context of a church and a shepherd. And incidentally, everyone, this picture is telling us that sheep should never be on their own. So much for this analogy where I can stay at home, watch a church on YouTube, and I'm a successful Christian. That is not what it is to be a Christian in the life of God's church. You're a sheep, a part of a sheepfold. As a born-again Christian, you're never meant to be alone. You're always meant to be in God's house, God's community, God's church. And you should always have a shepherd, somebody that's accountable for you, somebody that can, you know, lead you and guide you, not control you. Remember the scripture teaches that the elder is not to lord it over the people, not by constraint, all right? So there are particular things that a shepherd should and shouldn't do as a faithful minister of the gospel. And everyone, I'll just throw this one in for free. A good under-shepherd should know his sheep by name. And this is why formally we do actually lead into membership because we want to know that, hey, you're here. All right? That doesn't mean if you're not a member, we don't love you or we don't know you by name. It's not the point here. The point is that we formalise who ultimately is committed to the Lord's church here in this location uh, and, and so we do that through membership. Verse 4, he puts forth his own sheep. So a shepherd should know his own sheep, right everyone? You've got to know who those, uh, who are yours. And so that's important. He goes before them and the sheep follow him. And notice everyone, that the, the good shepherd leads, is out in front of them. They should have already learned, practiced, applied what they're actually teaching themselves. And let's have a look at, uh, let's turn to the book of Numbers, everyone. Again, another pastoral analogy. But I think a good one to see that this isn't uh, just an, an isolated occurrence that Christ is talking about here. These things are replete through the Old Testament as well. Numbers 27, uh, 15 and 16 are speaking again over the model of um, congregational um, uh, model that the Lord would set out for his people. Numbers 27. Verses 15 and 16. Again, uh, the Lord speaking uh, to the leadership. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. What's this man going to do? He's going to go out before them, lead them, which may be led out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep who have no shepherd. It's very clear here that a pastoral true minister is going to have the sheep as central focus. He will lead them out. He is set over the congregation by the Lord. It must be divinely appointed, Christ appointed. It must be obvious to the sheep that they be not as sheep without a shepherd. What did the Lord say when he looked out over the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were as sheep without a shepherd? They should care for the sheep as his own. He takes ownership, responsibility for them as one of his own. He takes account for them. Not just their care, but their growth. Care is one thing. Growth is another, right, everyone? To really be what they're meant to be, there's got to be both care and growth. The two have to go together. Little wonder the true minister bears great responsibility for the sheep under his care. Um, All of us must have a shepherd. Yes, we all have the chief shepherd. Amen, everyone? Amen. But we're all under a shepherding influence for the care of our own soul. Uh, again, we've addressed 
the dangers or the concerns of those wanting to be lone sheep or isolated sheep, uh, being drawn away. Um, and quite frankly, this is why some pastors can get quite anxious about people who don't show up for a long time because they could genuinely be in a lot of strife out there, uh, prey to wolves, uh, false teaching, and so forth. Verse 5. Note, everyone, the sheep has a second responsibility, not just to A, follow the true minister of Christ, but to B, flee from or not follow the voice of strangers. Notice it's the voice, everyone. It's the voice of strangers. What's the first indication that you'll spot a fake, a fraud, a thief, a robber? How are you going to tell? How does our Lord give us? Uh, what, what key? The voice. What they teach, what they say, what they ask, what they demand. That's the trigger point. Watch that, everyone. You as a sheep have a, a dynamic instinct here, a discerning ability that the Lord has embedded into you as believers. You can spot a fake, a fraud. The instinct enables you to distinguish between and test the spirits of those who claim they're true ministers and those who aren't true ministers. You can tell the difference between true and false teachings. Have you ever been listening to something and you go, that just doesn't sound right? That sounds really off to me. It's like eating food, you go, mm, that does not taste right. Like that tastes off. You want to get it straight out of your mouth, straight away, don't you? It's like, oh my gosh, that is off. Who, who, who left that in the fridge? All right? Um, same way as sheep, we listen and we go, that's not sounding good. That is not sounding healthy. That doesn't sound right. We get this when we have people that say, hey, I'm a Christian, and then they say these other things after and you think, hmm, if you're a Christian, you probably wouldn't be saying those other things. So not for us to make this eternal judgment about their soul, but we do need to be listening to voices, don't we? All right? Remember, the abundance of the heart comes out of the mouth. So we get to see where somebody's heart truly is when they speak. A stranger they will not follow. I want you to underline that in your Bible. A stranger they will not follow. I'm pro. You're not even listening to any false teachers. I just want to hear what they're teaching. I want to hear all the errors. I want to hear all the heresies. Forget it. Jesus tells you, don't even listen to them. Don't even follow them. Don't listen to their voice. But I want to follow them on YouTube. I want to follow them on Facebook. I want to forget it. Switch the TV off. Listen to good teaching that will feed your soul. Amen, everyone? Listen to the guys you know. You won't have to spit out all the bones. Don't be worried about that. You've been given, 1 John 2.20, an unction, an anointing from the Holy Spirit. You know right from wrong. You know it. When you hear unsound teaching, you should know it. There should be a hesitancy, a, a, you know, a real concern about that. And quite frankly, everyone, the opposite is also true. Those who commit to false teachers aren't God's true sheep. Because Jesus says, a true sheep will not follow them. So those who are lost to false teachers, this is a great hope for me as a pastor. Because I know the true sheep won't follow a fake or a fraud. And if they spot them, they'll leave straight away. They'll flee. All right? They will not follow. They will flee. And they will find a true church where Christ is truly honoured and truly taught. Uh, an author called Brentius, who J.C. Ryle quotes, says this, The skill in the young lamb, talking about immature Christians, he's bringing a compliment here. He says, The skill in the young lamb, although being mainly dull and stupid, it has extraordinary knowledge as it can determine and distinguish its own mother's bleats from a thousand others. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's, own, it, it's only a, a little baby lamb. It can hardly stand up on its own four legs, but it can hear its mother's bleat above all the others and go and find it. This is the skill that you have as believers. Your listener, your ears, God has attuned them as born-again believers for you to know a true minister of Christ and to spot a fake. And you have a gut instinct to be drawn to the true and, and flee from the false. Right. Now this parable, verse 6, Jesus speaks to the false teachers, but they what? They don't understand. They don't get it. Well, hang on, so does, doesn't Jesus teach parables to make things easier to understand? Doesn't he use pictures and stories to make things easier? No. Turn with me to Matthew 13 for a minute. Matthew 
13 verses 10 and 11. I mean, at this point, the disciples are a little bit disturbed about Jesus' teaching parables because they're worried that nobody's getting it. And so they come to him and they say, why do you speak to the crowd in parables? Well, Jesus, why are you doing this? I love how the disciples question Jesus' teaching technique. You know, the teacher of all teachers. Well, why are you doing this, Lord? What does he say? He answers them, and watch this, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it is not given. Wow. I think Jesus is very clear here on teaching in parables because it's a sign of judgment. If you've got ears to hear, what do I know? You're born again. You're one of my sheep. If you don't hear, what's going on? You're not a sheep. Or at least not yet. We don't know. It's up to the Lord to decide in His sovereign will. This is a mark as a shepherd for me. Who's listening to God's word? Who's applying it? That's what I ask of each of you and those who call this church their home. Who's listening to God's word? Who's following the Lord Jesus? Who's hearing what God's word is being taught? Who's not listening? Who's rejecting? Who's not following? Who's not willing to have a shepherd over their lives? Who's not willing to say, you know what? I'll accept, and listen to me, a sheep in Psalm 23 feels the rod, feels the staff. Listen to me, what's the rod do? <coughs> the shepherd has a staff. It's there to literally grab the crook of the sheep around the neck and bring it back in. Don't stray too far. All right? Now, when you go to grab something and bring it back in, and it doesn't want to be grabbed and it runs further away, what's going on? What's the shepherd going to think? You don't want to be a sheep? All right? This is not me saying I'm going to control you, but if I'm responsible, I've got to use a rod and a staff. What's staff? Staff is authority. God has given his pastor's authority to care for leadership. And, and I only have authority. Guys, watch this. I only have authority as far as the word of God. So I can only teach you what God teaches you. Uh, I can't say anything more than that. I'm not the boss of you, all right? <laughs> I'm not the boss of you. Anything you do to serve in the local church is serving who? Me? I don't think so. You're serving the Lord Jesus. All right? So here's the kicker now. He speaks these things they don't understand. In John 16, 25, <coughs> I think Jesus makes it even clearer again. He says, these things I've spoken to you in Proverbs. Figures of speech, narrative riddles, so to speak. But the time will come and I will speak no more in Proverbs and I will show you plainly of the Father. So yeah, I'll speak in Proverbs right now because I don't want everyone to necessarily know what's going on. I want the parable to be proof that it's condemnation. If you don't understand a parable, you're condemned already. You don't understand it, you're condemned already. Finally, in verses 7, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I am the door of the sheep. I am the only way into the church. This is exclusive salvation in Christ. Calvin notes, Jesus compares himself to the door of the church because there's no other entrance into the church but by himself. The doorway is the access point. I am the way. I am the door. Do you know in, in, when the shepherd couldn't get back the sheep to the sheepfold? Do you know what the shepherd had to do because he couldn't stay awake all night? He had to sleep. He would build a wall of rocks around the sheep and put some thatching over the top and he would lie in the door. He would literally become the door. And Jesus says, I am the door. You can't get into the church. You can't leave the church without my say-so. I mean, Christ is Lord of his sheep. He is the good shepherd. And remember, everyone, this picture plays out a lot further down in the passage where he says, I will lay down my life as the door for the sheep. So it's a vivid picture we've got here. Jesus, of course, as the door, fulfills Ezekiel 34 as the one shepherd, the great shepherd. In Matthew 18, he is the great shepherd who saves his sheep and picks them back as they stray and brings them back on his shoulder. In Matthew 9, Jesus is the shepherd who has pity on the people who are without a shepherd. 
In Luke 12, he calls his true disciples the little flock. And Peter says of Jesus that he is the great shepherd of our souls, the great shepherd of the sheep. There is no doubt that Christ is the archetype of shepherd uh, of the sheep. In verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. This isn't all everyone categorical. Or else uh, John the Baptist and all the prophets were thieves and robbers. No. No, this is all in context false teachers who he's addressing. So all of you religious leaders, all of you fakes and frauds, all of you who came as messiahs, and by the way, everyone, it's not just all past tense, it's going to be all future tense. Because Jesus tells us there will be false what? Shepherds in the future, false Christ, false messiahs, coming in my name, bearing great miracles, bearing great signs. And we could go to the minor prophets and look how the Antichrist will be a false shepherd. Doing great miracles. Don't have time for that, but it's all there. Verse 9, I am the door. By me. I want you to underline that, everyone. I am the door. By me. Through me. Only via my name can any man enter in and be saved. This, in reference, everyone, is into the sheepfold. You're only saved if you're in the church. I'm not talking physically in the church or attending Sundays. I'm talking you must be in Christ's church to be saved. Amen? You can't be in church of Mormon or church of Jehovah's Witnesses. You need to be in Christ's church. You need to be in his body. And those, here's the great promise, everyone. Those in Christ's church will be able to go out and come in and find pasture and food for their souls. Beautiful promise, everyone. If you're a believer and you're in Christ's church, you've been saved through him, you've come in by him, you will find food for your soul. You should be in that place where you go, thank you, Lord Jesus, I'm reading your word, I'm being fed in a local church, I feel like and I know that I'm getting fed, I can go out into the world, I can serve you, I can come back into the church on a Sunday or during the week or know that my under-shepherd knows my name, cares for my soul, prays for me, gets out for me, and Lord, you are ultimately, even if my under-shepherd gets it wrong. And friends, let me just, little memo here. Even if I fall, even if things go wrong with my life, even if all else fails, we don't look to the under-shepherd as the shepherd of our soul, do we? Thank the Lord for that. We don't look to the Apostle Paul. We don't look to Peter. We don't look to the great pastors and leaders of our movement today, although they should be good exemplified examples of Christ. We look to who everyone the Lord Jesus. Yeah. All right? He is the great sustainer of all under shepherds in the church and he is the great keeper of the sheep. Yeah. We'll enter in, we'll be saved, we will go in and out and find pasture for our souls. Think of Psalm 23. He leads me beside still waters. In the presence of my enemies, we'll always have enemies. There'll always be a thief. There'll always be a robber. There'll always be somebody in the church trying to cause division, trying to cause an issue, trying to undermine the the authority of maybe the under-shepherd or the teaching of God's Word. There'll always be somebody detracting from preaching Christ. Why don't we preach more of this? Why don't we do more of that? But our focus is Christ and Him alone. Paul said, I do not preach myself. I preach Christ and Him crucified. There's the voice of a true shepherd. We point to the Lord Jesus. Finally, every one verse 10, and we plays out the song. The thief comes not. There is only one intention for the sheep. No other intention. The thief comes not, but to steal, kill, destroy. There's your ungodly trinity right there. Underline those three. Let me talk you through what that looks like. Steal, kill, destroy. Firstly, the enemy starts with pilfering, stealing. Now, I don't know any of you uh, that, that have ever stolen anything before, but... Pilfering, shoplifting, those types of things that can be done very under the radar, can't they? All right? Now, the word uh, for thief in the Greek is the word kleptus. It's deceptive, it's done in secret. So, how does the Lord start? Uh, how does the devil start, sorry? He starts just quietly, the peppering away, sowing seeds of doubt. Did the Lord really say? Remember Eve in the garden? All right? Does the Lord really think? Do you think that's really a true pastor? Do you think he'd speak to you that way if he was really true? What's the aim? The aim is to get enough doubt in the sheep, enough uh, insecurity in what's going on, and to isolate the sheep through doubt. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I think I'm going to take a few steps. I think I'm going to step away in isolation on my own over here. I think I'm, I'm starting to get some thoughts and some ideas, and I really feel that this might not be. And where are you? You're now in isolation. So as the enemy can sow doubt and discord and distrust in your heart, he can steal away your confidence, steal away your faith in what's going on. Steal away your ability to trust in the promises of God, in the men and the women of God that the Lord's put over your life. And watch this. To kill. What's he going to kill? It's going to kill off your faith. That's the aim. Remember, if you're the Lord's, he will keep you. But the bottom line is there's lots of people who come and go out of church. Isn't it true that, that this good sower sows the seed? What's the seed? The seed is the word of God. So this morning... I'm sowing God's word into your heart. I'm sowing it into the good seed of your soil, in your heart. And what does the devil come and immediately want to do straight away? Take it out. Oh, you don't want to believe that. You don't, want it. you don't really think that's the way it is. He'll steal that away from you, which is the only hope you've got in God's word. If he can steal that away from you, then he'll kill. Watch this. He'll, he'll basically... Kill your faith. He'll kill off your belief in anything the Lord commands. And ultimately, he'll try and take your life prematurely. Through addiction, through wrong decisions, through doing whatever he possibly can. We know this because Job's family, he killed straight away. He killed them off. If the devil's allowed to do whatever he can, he'll, ki he'll kill everyone straight away. The devil does not have free reign in the earth. Thirdly and finally, steal, kill. Kill is a physical kill. And then destroy. He wants to see your soul eternally destructed in hell. And he'll do that successfully, but not with God's sheep. Amen, everyone? Amen. The good shepherd, Jesus tells us, on a high, let's finish on a high, everyone, comes to give us life and life more abundantly. What a great promise that is. Christ gives us spiritual life and life more. But the devil cannot take the life Christ has given to you. Let's be clear on that. So what have we been taught this morning? Well, John reminds us, I wrote these things that you may believe on him who can give you life. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I wrote these things that you may believe and then in believing you may have life in his name. Jesus has given us a theology of salvation here. As sheep in his pasture, all of us together, He's given us a theology of salvation. The good shepherd, that is Christ, as I close out, has already chosen his sheep. He's already chosen them. He's already named them. He knows who they are. He possesses full and sole authority to go into the nations of the world and find his sheep and call them by name. He knows them. He calls them. He rec they recognize his voice and they follow him. They will not follow a stranger they will not be lost to false teachers and lying deceivers. I can't tell you how that strengthens and encourages my heart. That's our Lord's promise. And like the great shepherd, shepherds in Israel who were true shepherds, the great shepherd knows his sheep. He knows them by name. Why? Because they're written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Watch it, everyone. The Lamb's Book of Life. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Let's pray.